Welcome again to uh, the Jerry Reynolds Show here at the beautiful studios at McCreary's of Furniture. And, uh, and obviously, as we say all the time, if you want the best furniture in Sacramento, this is where you'd come. Not to this studio, but to McCreary's uh, Furniture Store here on uh, Auburn Boulevard. So that, with that note, uh, got a wonderful guest here, uh, one of the more gifted uh, young uh, TV analyst and uh, podcasters and I don't know what else you do, Morgan. Uh, Morgan Reagan, by the way, uh, we you know you probably already know who she is, but Morgan Reagan, and we'll get into all of her uh, career situations. Yes, thanks, Jerry. That's sweet of you. Um, goodness, there's been so many things throughout the years because you know in this career field you have to be able to do everything. So. That's why it's funny whenever people do ask, I just say the main thing that I do. And then when they're like, oh, well, what else do you do? That's when then I rattle on digital this, kings.com this. Uh, so I did sideline reporting here. I was a radio host here. I did, you know, Good Day Sacramento here. So that's really amazing. I mean, your versatility or versatility, uh, of all the things, of course, but as you said, I mean, you know, something you, you just have to do in order to to stay in the business and create your own niche, so to speak, I think. Yeah. And how crazy is that? I'm sure, you know, just you've seen this business for so long now and you get to see like, oh, you get to be good at one thing kind of going, you know, growing through the years. And obviously you were great with, you got to do so many other things with coaching and being a GM and then broadcasting. But if you want to be a broadcaster nowadays, it's okay, well, what can you do on social media? What can you do with writing? What can you do um, on camera? Even mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of these writers that I've known around the Sacramento Kings now, they're like, they used to only just write, write, write columns, uh, uh -huh. articles, whatever it may be. And now they're like, our company is forcing us to do podcasts. Our company is forcing us to do on camera work. Like, and sometimes they're awkward, but it's great because they're they're learning well, something new. Yeah, something new, and really how difficult it is too. Because sometimes you don't really d realize how difficult someone else's job is till you get in their shoes a little while and walk down that road. I think that's exactly it, and that's what I've even realized with all this. It's like, oh, that wasn't as easy as I thought it was going to be. Oh, the amount of prep and homework that goes into this is why that job, why someone gets paid that money and why that's a full-time gig, you know, mm -hmm. even though it's a once every two weeks that they're doing something sometimes. So mm -hmm. the, the, the thing I'd, I'd like to kind of get into a little bit, cause I know your, your backgrounds are, you know, unique uh, cause you were a, an outstanding player basketball in particular. Thanks. And now what high school did you go to and when did this uh, stardom start occurring? Yes, the stardom. So I went to, my parents moved to Granite Bay before, mm -hmm. and that's kind of Granite Bay, Roseville area. And it was before Granite Bay High School was even built. Mm -hmm. um, we lived in a small house where I shared a room with my sister. And I remember we had a little hoop outside like it just came with the house I think it was cricket and everything mm -hmm. and started just taking a ball and playing out there and then my dad's like oh you like this then here let's get in a rec league got in a rec league and then once Granite Bay High School was built mm -hmm. um went to Granite Bay High School played there and just being honest they never had a good women's program right almost ever but something great happened. My uh, All four years I played on varsity, my sophomore year, we were the first and still the only women's basketball team to win um, the SFL title. And so oh, I know, that's great. Yeah. I know it was, it was, it was a really cool accomplishment for the program. And, but then after that, you know, mm -hmm. nothing more. And so I had to go into AAU because uh -huh. obviously if you're going to play at this high school, like you're not going to be seen. And I mm -hmm. wanted to be seen. I wanted to, 
um, explore what kind of scholarship options mm -hmm. I could produce out of this talent that I had. And, um, and so, yes. Yeah, so and then I played a lot of AU basketball in the area as well. Now, what was your position? I was a point guard and shooting guard. Mm -hmm. I think this is so funny talking about my game right now and being like, so I think I was a really good shooter, but my, my, the way that I could see the floor I was a quarterback mm -hmm. and that's what I enjoyed most. And even now when I look at the game of basketball, I enjoy a solid point guard. And, and that's not on the stat sheet all the time, you know? Oh, well, it, absolutely. Yeah. You know, that's a, you know, there's no stat for leadership, nope. getting people in the right places, things of that nature, but that's, that's the job. Too. Right. Right. And even, cause even sometimes people go, well, that's assists. And it's like, no, that's not even, I mean, the way that, you are being a floor manager and telling your teammates where to go and you're seeing them and it goes it goes from your beautiful pass to which then goes into the assisted pass to the basket it it all starts with you and so i felt like that's what i did growing up i felt like i just saw the floor and could do that but when you don't have pieces around you in high school that was hard in aau it was awesome i was around uh, girls at the time that could dunk and they went to sack high but then you know i got to play with them and it was yeah. it was great because then it also brought scouts to all of our games when we traveled the country to go play basketball what well, is amazing to me with the the women's game how rapidly it's improved i've always said just when i started getting involved with the monarchs and trying to learn and understand the women's game i always said that it's it's improved at a more rapid rate than the men's game yeah you know, i mean partially just having a you know finally having people involved and, 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 you know, all that, uh, it bring, you're getting, you know, when I first started watching it, you know, very seldom did you see a really, a a girl really with a hard drive, a pull off, off the dribble with the jump shot. Totally. It and wasn't that, as explosive, right? Uh, no, no. Now it's, you know, it, it, it is. And I mean, you're seeing the athleticism and, and, and the physicality of it, yes. you know, I mean, to where, you know, the, the women's game is becoming, you know, more physical, yes. and, you know, as the talent, yeah, but it's all part of the, I think the process. I agree. I think it's also the access that mm -hmm. people have to different, um, tr training and access to knowledge of how to play the game and how to play the game at the highest level. Well, the highest level is the NBA. Mm -hmm. So why not try to copy what these guys are doing in the NBA? Sure. And that's what I used to do. I used to take an app on my phone and, and this is what we even talked about the other day, obviously with Kobe's passing, I used to take videos of Kobe and I would practice his footwork and how he would get his shot off so quick. Mm -hmm. And people, I think only hoopers really understand how wonderful his footwork were, was and how much it really created space to, for him to get these shots off and do what he needed to do. I wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, I obviously wasn't doing that just like him, but I was, I remember when I was practicing really hard, I could get there. And so when I practice how to play, like, honestly, a man in the NBA, that's when I noticed my game going higher. And I think that's happened for a lot of women um, being like, oh, I'm not just going to settle and people say, oh, women can't dunk. So I'm not going to try and dunk. No, I'm going to do as many plyometrics and work that I can do to dunk like that guy right there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's uh, absolutely happened. And I know with uh, now moving on from your basketball career and, and of course now, when did, you know, at what age did you kind of think, well, I've taken this playing thing about as far as I can, uh, and I really do have an interest, you know, in sports, not necessarily all sports or whatever, and, and can I make a career out of this? So that was around 22, I want to say, and I wanted to keep playing because I wanted to go play pro and ball, and I did in San Francisco, and I was like, if I can go overseas, then I can become, you know, a semi-pro player and get into broadcasting. Yeah. That was how my mindset went uh -huh. because I didn't know anybody that was in broadcasting. I didn't know how any other ways. I only knew basketball. I only knew sports. So how was I going to do this? So once my body gave up and my shoulder just came dislocating out of my socket every second mm -hmm. and I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. No. Yeah, I don't think you can play if you don't have a left hand anymore, no, right? no. So that's when I started uh, interning with News 10. I went back to school because you had to be enrolled in a class. So I took a journalism class and I went back to school to 
get into broadcasting. Now in high school though, I was part of a broadcasting program since I was 13, 14 years old mm -hmm. because I knew I wanted to do TV, but I knew I wanted to do sports as I got, yeah. got older. That's great. They had the program there to, to, to really. Uh, so, count. so lucky. Yeah. I, I mean, Granite Bay high school, you know, obviously a, a school with a lot of money growing mm -hmm. up and having that access to uh, a studio mm -hmm. and I'm reading off a teleprompter and doing a daily bulletin. Like I was like, this makes me feel all the feels. And you feel like the other thing I loved about it though, you felt like everyone was a teammate, mm -hmm. the person behind the camera, the person doing the lights, the person well, doing the are, audio. Yeah. And they are. And that's, and I think that's where I felt like I was still in a sport. So that's why I wanted to continue that after I was done doing a sport. Mm -hmm. So I did that. Uh, and then started interning for News 10, and I was like, I'm going to yeah, get into is, sports broadcasting. Is, I always say, though, that's a great point you made on the, the the team aspect of it, because I've always said over the years with the Kings, people would say, well, it's really tough. How do you you know, keep interest? The team's not very good. And I said, yeah, but I said, our team, yes. the broadcast team, and that's really who you start identifying with, you know, when you're traveling with them all the time and, yeah. and, and really have your – so our team is – our team is really good. Yeah. You know, and we have great chemistry. So, so, so that makes all the difference now, you know, and there over the years, there's been, I think maybe one, maybe two guys that, you know, didn't quite fit. You yeah. Know, just like any, they don't buy in. Yeah. You know, just like, just like any kind of team on the court, mm -hmm. you know, that sort of thing. And, uh, and how funny is that though, after a game? And this is what's so fun too, because now that I do color for mm -hmm. the NBA G League, color analyst, um, which, once again, for people who don't know, that's what Jerry was doing at a much higher level. But when you have a good game as a color analyst, like you call just this awesome broadcast, even if your team loses, but you you called it, you didn't call it like a homer. You called it for both teams. So even if the other team is, you know, throwing it down, they have these amazing highlights and you're just you're just having some great calls. How good you feel like you won a game sometimes. It, yeah, you know, it it does certainly take away a little bit, a good bit of the pain. I mean, when yes. you when you've had a, a you know, and, I, and like you make a good point. I, I've always said I I'm a homer. I'll never deny that. But uh, uh, I really love basketball. So mm -hmm. you know, when the Kings are playing bad, you know, and Grant and I are doing the game, I I I could you know appreciate the other team. Yeah. You know, if they're playing great. Yeah. And and you know, and if you're seeing. Uh, terrific players playing at, at a high level, you know, I mean, it's like, you know, I mean, you can't appreciate greatness, you know, and I mean, in other words, that's, I always say that's what I, I appreciate the most is competitive greatness, guys who really, you know, are putting it out there every night. And, right. And uh, so, you know, I, I say it's easy to find something kind of good, even in a bad game, uh, I think. And, and I think that's, you know, that's where the enjoyment is. You know, I mean, for me, it's like, hey, the ball goes up. Hey, it's basketball. I love it. And yep. so as a homer, I hope the Kings are playing good so I yeah. can extol their outstanding play. But if not, well, there's no reason I can't give be fair to the other team. Right. And try to, and I think maybe, be, which it took me a while to get there, to be fair to the officials. Uh, because yes. early on, it was like, you know, spend way too much time. Well, that call, blah 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 blah. You know, they got an impossible job. And I would say, you know, if, if players are allowed to, really, one of my bugs. They, you know, the NBA needs to get on top of this, where players think they've got to comment on every call Everything. and argue about it. It's like, wait a minute, how many officials run up to a player after they missed a layup, and say, "Hey, you stupid <laughs> fool, you missed a layup. What's wrong with you?" Yeah, you know, they ought to be allowed to do that. I know, a hundred percent. Or run over to a coach and what kind of substitution was that? That was stupid. Why'd you call a timeout there? You, you know, I mean, it'd be the same kind of mentality here, and and, and I don't think we, you know, I mean, these guys, as far as I'm concerned, they deserve a lot more respect uh, on the court from all the participants, and yep. I think the NBA and the Players Association are making a huge mistake in not getting control of that. I completely agree because I remember. In even at the college level, you know, there's more discipline. You're yes. getting yelled at by a coach being like, you you want to go take your time and yell at a referee? You can sit your ass on the bench. Like, yeah. excuse yeah, me. Yeah, no, you didn't. 
Yeah. Or, you or, know? I kind of like, you know, of course, I'm, as you know, older than dirt, but I always remember, you know, the days when you made a foul and you had to raise your hand. Yeah. And that was that was it. It's like know? a respect factor. Like, hey, it's me. I, it's on me. I, I wouldn't, you know, I'd have no problem with the head coach being able to have a, a brief chat or the captain, mm -hmm. a designated captain. Yes. You know, something like that. But, but to me, it just takes away from the game when you have every call, every player, you it know, totally does. I think they have to have an opinion. Well, it takes away from the game, but think about it again, going back to that team aspect. It takes away from the team. It's deflating when you have one player every single time complaining about the calls. You're like, be better than that. But you're absolutely right because then there are those calls where you're like, we need to have a voice. We need to tell the official why. At least have that, an opinion. Sure. Yeah, communication. They, I mean, they, and there are missed calls. I, I don't know any official yeah. tell you that because it's an impossible game to call. Yep. And... uh you know, I was I've told on TV a few times that my experience at officiating, you know, I, I officiated in high school some in Indiana. Uh -huh. In my last game, me and my partner got a police escort out of town because there were people <laughs> beating on the, I mean, we were in danger. What'd you do, Jerry? And What'd you well, do? Well, I thought I called a good game, <laughs> but it wasn't what the home team was. Mm -hmm. And I always said that, that I know we, we got 15, 20 miles out of town and found a bar and and like we drank up everything we made officiating, and I said, you know, <laughs> this this makes no sense. Took a shot for every whistle you blew. Yeah. So anyway, but nice. uh, now with your, uh, I know you 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 work with a junior Kings program. I, I'd like to get your thoughts on that. How, yeah. You know, exactly. Tell me about that and what 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 uh, you like. What's your role in that? So it's funny that you bring this up because I was I was actually excited to to bring this up. I recently, in the last few months, uh, decided to leave Junior Kings to focus fully, full-time on broadcasting. On broadcasting. Because that's something else I realized in life. When you just know you love something and you belong somewhere, then you that's what you do. And you put everything in it. And once again, you can go back to... Kobe being so fresh on everyone's minds and that Mamba mentality of like, be the best. And that's, I realized I was giving eight hours a day in an office, even for junior Kings, which I'll go more into. And then at night running off to a game that I would be prepping in a car, you know, having 45 minutes and then getting to the game prepping while I'm there. And I wasn't calling the game to the best of my ability mm -hmm. in G league for everyone out there. There's a lot of turnover. It's not the NBA where you're just like, you know what LeBron James does. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And players, which you know, yes. and, and I mean, no, yes. I, I agree. I just watching you guys work, uh, you know, it's like, wow, who, who are these people? Exactly. Or, exactly. And, and, you know, I, I've been lucky enough to work with Deuce Mason who, you know, as would help me prep on the way there. Or but unlucky as the case. And very unlucky and yeah, in many, I mean, many be, ways. You know, I mean, there's, there's varying opinions. Mostly unlucky, but those few lucky times. And so, so when that kind of happened, my first season with color, I was like, you got to make a change. Mm -hmm. And Junior Kings is the youth basketball program with the Sacramento Kings. Mm -hmm. And I was managing the entire program and it was awesome. It was awesome from the standpoint of having a female too leading mm -hmm. these kids. And so many kids, I remember being like, girls don't play basketball. And I'm like, it is 2019 and we still have <laughs> yeah, little yeah. boys saying this. <laughs> yeah. Like, what are your parents teaching you? And so I got to teach them mm -hmm. like, and if they did want to talk smack, I did take a few little seven year olds to the hole. Cause I was yeah. like, uh, -uh yeah, you know, yeah, they got to pay the price. I got to embarrass you in front of your peers. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, parents, but they got to learn. And so it, but honestly that the entire program, the junior NBA program, a lot of the NBA teams have a junior NBA program and they're amazing. They're mm -hmm. amazing of what they promote. They promote good basketball. They promote sportsmanship and all these wonderful things, but there is a lot more to it in the office of, you know, being in the community and all the other work you have to oh, do. Oh, yeah, I knew that. It's just, I mean, it's really almost full-time, obviously. It, exactly. And so the coaching part, I miss it already mm -hmm. so much. My my favorite thing is is coaching young girls, and they're just so empowering, watching them. They listen. They mm -hmm. care. And then there's a few there's a few little boys that care and don't think that they know it all. Mm -hmm. But you, but it's always every every little girl out there, it's like, this is why I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so not doing it has been sad, but also I'm like, okay, well, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to fulfill your dreams to the fullest now. And that's my journey now that I've left uh, Junior Kings. Mm -hmm. I always thought too, too, I mean, uh, you mentioned the coaching part. I mean, I think it's something obviously you could do if you 
chose to do that. I, yeah. I mean, I think that's a natural uh, thing, you know, that obviously your background and, 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 and probably does even in a lot of ways enhance the ability as an analyst, I think, you know, Absolutely. I, mean, I always say that's, that's one thing. I think a lot of times fans, even very knowledgeable fans don't realize the, from the coaching standpoint, well, you don't really know what happens in that locker room. You know, yes. the, the, there's there's things that go on between, you know, in that tunnel and, and all that that's very different than what, what you think is going to happen. And, and uh, some words said that might hurt your little feelings. Right. And then you need to, you know, it's an experience that probably everybody needs maybe a little bit. And you know, what's that's what's actually really cool about the G League compared to NBA because I wish – I could talk about the Sacramento Kings and talk about what they did in practice, but obviously practice is not open to the media. Um, there's so many locker room is not open to the media, but the Stockton Kings and the G league, they give you so much access that they Deuce And I've been to a practice and they are coming over to coaches are coming over to us and letting us know, Hey, we're running this because we're trying to accomplish this or the big league or the big team, you know, the Sacramento Kings want us, to accomplish this zone. Uh -huh. And so, you know, we're doing this, 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 this. And getting gaining all that knowledge and seeing these guys and even the way that they express when their coaches are talking to them and the amount of respect that's there, you can carry that into the broadcast and be like, oh, these guys buy in with Ty Ellis. You know, there's not a single guy out there that thinks they're too good for this zone defense right. or whatever it may be. So it is, it really is important, just like you were saying, that coaching aspect too and being able um, to see that part and that you side. Know, you know, it's kind of interesting to me is how the NBA has changed to where probably when I first came to the league, I mean, pretty much all practices were open. I mean, you oh, it's a little bit so like the G cool. League to where you really wanted the media there yeah. so they would understand and, and yes. so have some idea what you're trying to do. And, and if it's not working, at least you were working on it. Yes. You know, that yes. sort of thing. And then really in the last... 20 years or so, it's it just kind of went away to where it's just such a closed shop, you know. And I, I think in many ways the, the league is missing something there. And I don't say, I wouldn't say that you should have every practice open. No. But there ought to be a, a reasonable percentage that are totally open. Yeah, you know? I, I agree. I mean, there's not, it's not nuclear science here. Right. Yeah, uh, you know. Right. I mean, and, and so I don't know, you know, what you're, sometimes what you're trying to hide, you know. Yeah, and do you think sometimes that maybe they are trying to hide, like, oh, guys getting yelled at or disciplined or, you know, they don't want to share some of those things and have guys feel like that they were, um, you know, looked at a different way at practice. I, I think sometimes they are just sheltering too much, like not trying to really tell the whole story. And that's a disservice to media and basketball fans, not necessarily even just, Kings fans or Lakers fans or whoever, yeah, real hoopers. Well, basketball too, yeah, purists. I think you're, you know, it, it, it's one of those things now to where, well, say years ago, I, mean, I always remember had a practice and a couple of guys got in a fight, fist fight. Okay, yeah, and the media was saying, well, sh you know, what do you think, or should we write about this? I said, well, it happened. You know, <laughs> nothing more. <laughs> yeah, you know, there nobody is seriously hurt and they're friends again. Yes, uh, you know, that's. You know, right. that's a competitive practice that went a little too far. Two guys got, uh, no, I, I said, I don't see anything anything to hide there. Yeah. Just tell the truth. And if you're trying to, and let's say you're someone who's looking for clicks and trying to create a narrative and you're going to write this weird story about it, um, well, that's wrong, number one, but number two, that's going to happen with anything. Even sure. if they, even if it happens when they have access of you on the floor or they see you on the bench, you two, two people talking and getting into it, like they're going to create that narrative anyway. So just people need to be strong minded. And I say that, and that's why now mental health is such a big thing too. It's learn how to deal with something like that in the media if that's told about you and if you got in that fight, what are you going to do different as a player? Not get in that fight next yeah, time. Yeah. And, uh, be, and, and should be, uh, man enough uh, uh, to say I was wrong yes. you know I shouldn't have, I should not have done that I should yes. not have done that and and we're both guys whatever yeah you know just just that to, yeah it's a yeah it's kind of a you know kind of an interesting thing there but you know it, it I do understand how things have changed certainly in the coaching level uh you know we're to yell at somebody now and at, at a game is is like you you you've 
you're open for some kind of awful criticism. Yes. It's like, well, sometimes, uh, you know, it some criticism, <laughs> vocal criticism is necessary. Right. And uh, if, if the young player is such a delicate little flower that <laughs> that that uh, harsh words uh, will affect his uh, his career then probably it's not a career he's going to do well in boom to grow some thicker skin because that's you know you're exactly right about that because i think that's the beauty of even college basketball still and even some g league these guys have one goal and that's get into the nba well they're not going to play unless they're listening to their G League coach. Sure. And so there is still discipline. And I even asked this of the Stockton Kings head coach, Ty Ellis, um, because I remember asking George Carl a long time ago when he was coaching the Kings about making players run. And he was like, you know, we're too old for that at this time. And I'm like, I was shocked because, you know, George Carl is someone, a coach that I'm like, he's a, a great coach. Ty Ellis was like, yes, I make these guys run and, you know, we'll even shoot a free throw in in between and if you miss it, we keep running. And it's not only for discipline, but it's also because you're going to, you're going to be under those circumstances in this game. If you're never, if you're never like disciplined, yes, held held accountable, accountable. it's how are you going to learn something new? And I think you're exactly right. Watching coaches yell or talk loudly to uh, players when they're doing something wrong, I think if it's done the right way, there's nothing wrong with that. I just, I, I don't. Well, yeah, you don't want to, I mean, I think, you know, belittling someone, embarrassing Correct. them, that, that's a whole that's different wrong. thing. But really legitimate criticism to improve the play, yep. you know, I think is there. But, you know, just uh, getting to your, uh, you and uh, Deuce doing the games. Yeah. So I'd like to know, you know, just for your own experience, obviously it's a, a new role for you. Mm-hmm. And, uh, how's that going? You know, I mean, uh, you know, as you, I know, as you get more experience, you see things you can maybe do better, uh, do differently, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think I'd like to start too. I think one of the coolest things has been being just even in this business and coming to all these Sacramento Kings games. It's been really cool because you have been one of the few men that like to sit down and talk basketball with me and we'll go off to the side and talk basketball. And this is since the beginning of time. This is before we even really knew each other. And that's, that's who you were. And having that gave me confidence into what I'm doing now. So thank you Mm -hmm. for that. Truly. I, 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 there's, I'm glad it didn't hurt you anyway. No, (laughs) no, it's really helped. And now that I am doing color, it's been nice talking to you even just a little bit about tidbits of how do you feel when you have a bad game? How do you feel when you have a good game? So now going into my second season with Deuce, as Deuce does play-by-play and I'm color, it is a dream come true. It is, when I'm doing that, it just feels so natural. Well, yeah, you, I was going to say, you definitely have the chemistry. And, uh, yeah. I mean, and, and, and I, I know it'll even get easier and better as you go because, you know, the, the getting in, getting out, uh, certainly from the color standpoint, obviously the play-by-play, you know, I, I've always said, I mean, I really believe it. They're the stars. Yes. And, uh, yep. you know, the color analyst should be the the pl- role player. That's exactly it. And, you know, that's why I don't like the national broadcast for the most part. The color analysts dominate the yep. the play. And, and sometimes you're missing what's going on in the court while they're jibber jabbing. I want to hear the story that's in front of me, you know, and, and like I appreciate some tidbits when we're at the free throw line, well, sure. some facts when we're. Um, the game's, you know, a 20 point lead and it's over, you know, give me, give me stories. But when the story is right in front of me, paint the picture. And that is the play by play voice. And Deuce loves to talk. So it's a perfect role for him. Yeah. He, yeah. He fills it up. Don't he? I mean, yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you. We'll, you know, later on, we'll get, get with Deuce and say, you know, gotta get Morgan in here a little more. Perfect. Thanks, Jerry. I'm going to need that help. (laughs) But But, I mean, but it is a, you know, work in progress, you know, I would yeah. say, you know, just working with Grant for years. And I thought it, we, we're probably into our third or fourth year for, I think we both got comfortable with one another. I think with Grant kind of getting comfortable with my sense of humor or not, <laughs> you know, I, I, cause I always said with Grant as, as much as I love the guy, I mean, he, he'd always, when I first started, it's like the, uh, a 15 foot jump shot, you know, in the first quarter and it scores eight to 10 and he'd go berserk. And I said, well, <laughs> 
<laughs> what are you going to do when it, it's 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 at the end of the fourth quarter? You know, where, where do you Head's going to explode. Like, what's going to happen? It's, uh, you know, this guy's getting paid millions of dollars to make that shot. Yeah. You know, it's, it really ain't that big a deal. Right. Uh, so, you know, so I, I mean, I, but I mean, we were we were different. And yet, you know, I always appreciated his not just knowledge, but. Uh, his control of the game, and it's up yes. to me to kind of fit in and add something without taking away from what he was doing, and then, and then, and maybe in his case, realize that well, it's not World War Three; it's it's an NBA basketball game. It's exactly, and and, and so you know to kind of soften it there a little bit, and, and you know to make the broadcast a little more enjoyable. Well, you even you know even how you're talking, you're you're your coach at heart, and so what you can give. If you're going to say something, teach something, make someone learn. Now, obviously, when you're talking for an entire game, sometimes, sometimes I'm just, and I'm sure you've done that too, where you're just kind of looking at the play and you're like, wow, that was a really good shot. Or, you know, <laughs> oh, they, sure. they were really explosive going to the basket. And it's like, how did they get to the basket? How good was that screen? How good was the play that they were running? And those are the things that I, you know, I think and you feel the same way. It's when you have those tidbits, that's when they really matter. And so that's why it's not about us talking the whole time. It's about us really educating people yeah, when we need to. Yeah, you really want to point out something, I think, that the, the average fans, oh, okay, I'll look for that or that. Ha uh, I always say, you know, I probably look at it really from the coach's perspective, and I always say when I'm watching, I'm really looking for the big things. Okay, uh, you know, why is this defense not working? Or, yeah. or, or could, could this – wouldn't a zone defense and be a nice tempo change here mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, getting into one little individual aspect of it, you know, or, or like I say, well, the old deal of, uh, you know, what, why is uh, Buddy Heald not being very effective? Well, he's shooting all of his shots off the dribble. Well, that's tougher right. uh, than spot shooting. Right. Uh, that, you know, just kind of simplify it and where yeah. you know, the guy at home can say, oh, yeah, that's, that's why. That makes sense. That makes sense. <laughs> no, it's so, it's so true. And, that's... and I, I think because, I mean, I think you can, uh, you, you know, I think most people tune into a game to be entertained. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't tune in for a coaching clinic. Correct. Uh, you know, I mean, and, you know, I say sometimes, uh, you know, color analysts have a tendency to, to want to show how bright they are. Right. You got you to gotta think, well, you know, that's that's really not their. Let that's it be not organic. What yeah. Yeah. They, they, that's not why they're tuning in. Uh, yeah. You know, because they may tune out it pretty soon if if you're going to. Just beat him up. With, oh yeah. Well, well, they should have switched there, and that guy when he steps out there, he's got to do this, and the second guy has to rotate over, and I think. I don't and, care. and like you were even talking before <laughs> yeah. about like officials, and if the color analyst is like, "That's a bad call," because this is if they're saying every call is a bad call, it's like you're not a fan. You're you know like yeah. stop right there. Don't don't just suggest mm -hmm. that it's a bad call and give mm -hmm. this false information well, to people. I tell you about my. <laughs> Second year with Grant, or it might even been, that, yeah, that Grant and I both got a, a, a guy, and I think it was justified. We He sent us two referees' uh, jerseys. He said, if you guys are going to call the game, like if you're going to make all the calls uh, as referees, and here's some jerseys to wear while you're doing it. No. And you know, it, it, but honestly, it's one of those things, it's like it was kind of a, one of those moments, you know. Yeah. It's like, you know, he's got a good point. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was an exaggeration, but he, uh, and I told Grant, I said, you know, we, we really have got to do better on this. And, and I think now, you know, and I know Grant's great, you know, he basically gives officials every, right. you know, yeah. every opportunity uh, and, and, and the benefit Our of the doubt, job. more than part, you know, benefit of doubt, which they deserve. So, you know, I think we tried to do that. And I know, you know, Doug's gr great that way too. Always. Of course, he was that way as a player. He didn't, he really focused on his play as opposed to that but yeah so like on that basis now you as a player how are you with officials <laughs> <laughs> i almost mentioned this earlier when you were talking about players going back and yelling at refs and everything i didn't talk to refs a lot but i did give them death glares that they did not deserve. Death glares. Huh? Death glare. Like I got teed up and I would say very bad words that I would say, I was saying it out loud. I wasn't saying it to you. You can't tee me up. <laughs> I had the most technical technicals in the league my freshman year of high school on varsity. 
It was not good. You know, the reason I, I brought that up is, you know, somehow, I'll be honest with you, that doesn't surprise me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know. I was feisty. I mean, I mean yeah, 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 feisty. I think that's a, that, that's a nice way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. I, and I regret it. I regret it now. Sure. Oh, sure. my gosh. hundred. If I knew what I obviously know now, I would be so much better of a player because you're the, it's the mental game that mm -hmm. took me out of my game. Um, because I thought every official was out to get me and they were, they knew players and officials knew exactly how to get me well, as so, a head case. Well, I was going to say, you know, I used to go back to the DeMarcus Cousins thing, That's you know, I was. it's like, uh, officials are, are human and, and, you know, he basically was so rude and abusive yes. to officials that at some point he did get bad calls. I have no doubt they're human. Right. And that's and, part of the game. And, and uh, it's like, geez, uh. You it's know. it's politics. It's you. It's the same thing in life. Like if you want to get somewhere in life, you have to build relationships. You have to be kind to people. And so when you get frustrated in those moments, what do you do? Instead of yelling at your boss or doing something evil, you take a deep breath. And that's what he should have done on the court. That's what I should have done. Sure. That's what a lot of people well, should do. Well, I say you know it's the old thing. You know, if you want to be respected, you have to give respect. Yep. And I think a lot of times people forget that. Oh and, yes, and, and and you know, and I mean, I understand there's times, but I mean, I look at guys like, you know, like Bogey, and, and in particular, uh, that plays hard and yeah. competitive, almost never, you know, never has a, a, a harsh word for an official. You know, we'll sidle up to him a little bit. Yeah, uh, that way, you know. You know who does too much already is Luca Luca Doncic. Yes, he he, he definitely. I think he's. Uh, going to have to uh, kind of tone it down. You're so much better than that. Bit. Yeah, you know, to where you, you're just not going. You get a lot of calls. You're not going to get them all. No, and, no. Uh, and he's better. And he can. And he will be just this absolute dominant, amazing player in the NBA. But like, if he can, which I have a feeling he will, if he can fix that aspect of his game, there's no stopping him. Yeah. No. I mean, I and I think it it does. You know, wears on teammates at some point yep. wears on even even fans so you know a lot of and i think it's not totally unusual for young players to to come in and and you know think they're entitled to every call I, i've noticed the improvement with a uh, uh a slight improvement devin booker you know who was yes. just terrible for you now he's still not great but yeah you know it's pretty selective now yeah so, so anyway no it's great to see improvement and so uh I know we kind of got to wrap up here, yeah. but I, I, I mean, you know, your career, obviously, I think, you know, you probably have to say you're probably ahead of schedule for what maybe you, you thought you would, be, where you'd be. But, but I mean, going forward, uh, obviously with the, the, the analyst role and mm -hmm. certainly as a female has been a lot tougher on yeah. you than, than a male. I mean, uh, you know, uh, it can go so many directions, but I, I think, you know, looking at Doris Burke on, on who's terrific Yes. You know, and and uh, the the niche she's carved out for herself, and everybody just appreciates how good she is. And, yeah. And uh, you know, so I think there's there are, there are opp opportunities that didn't used to be there. A hundred percent, and that's something too. Just really quick, it was going into the G League. They had sideline reporter, color analyst, and play-by-play -play open. Guess which one I went for because my confidence was low, and I was like, oh man, this is always a woman's role. Yeah. Sideline. Sideline. Yeah. I went for, and they said to me, because they wanted Deuce to do play by play, they said, We think you would be great with it. Well, I was like, Yeah, I mean, we do everything together. And I was like, I know the game. Of course, I could be a color analyst. They're like, That's what we want you to do. Mm -hmm. And I just, I still, to this day, I'll never sell my short self short again mm -hmm. because um, I am capable of doing so much more. And so many women out there are capable of doing so much more. We just haven't seen in front of our eyes we've seen a few you well, know i doors. think too i mean i i really think where what i've always said in the nba people they're so concerned about getting women coaches in about every team now in some role yeah but i said where well, they're really missing it and it'd be these this is in the front office yes you're so right i mean it's it, it so would be right. a, a, a easy a much easier adjustment than quite honestly than the coaching spot. yeah because uh you know it's it's scouting. It's it. They it's, know basketball. They, know they basketball. don't basketball. So yeah, I always uh, you know uh, become a good friend of mine, Ann Myers Drysdale, who yeah uh, is certainly involved with the Phoenix Suns on several different things. But I, I, I so you could put her at running a franchise. She would do terrific. Day one, be no problem. Yeah, 
And yet, you know, I mean, she has a significant role, whether it's some TV work for uh, the the uh, WNBA, some some roles with the with the sons, but never. But I mean, but she could. I mean, there's a, a person. The fact she's a female has nothing to do yeah, with it. Yeah. But she would uh, far, you know, far better prepared than probably two thirds of the people, you know, in in executive positions in. Uh, in the league right now. And you're right about that, Jerry. And you're right too. If we see more of that happening, then other women growing up or even in, you know, young women growing up will just be like, oh, wait, I can do that. I don't yeah. have to actually coach basketball. I don't have to be on TV. Great. I don't like either one of those, but I can be a leader sure. in sports of a team and a help team. run it. Yeah. Like, yes. Yes, of course. That'd be really, you and know, I'm, I makes, think we will see more of that. Oh, we will. I mean, it just makes well, that's what scares me. It makes perfect sense. So I always say, <laughs> if, if it's logical, it makes sense, yeah, it's going to take longer. hundred uh, percent. So that's it. But anyway, I, I think we'll close here uh, for now. But I, I really appreciate, uh, Morgan, you coming on. Thanks. We had a lot of fun. And I uh, hope uh, those of you out there uh, know a little bit more about Morgan Reagan than you did.